Okay, good morning or afternoon all. My name is Michael Downey and I'm very pleased to welcome you to another AWRI webinar presentation. Last week we kicked off the 2018-19 program with a look at TDN. This week's webinar will take a look at biosecurity. Now, like always, uh, we have a very experienced and knowledgeable speaker, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Marty Longbottom. Marty is a senior viticulturist here at the AWRI and has extensive experience, uh, both hands-on and technical with vineyard management. Marty has a strong interest in sustainability projects and plays a vital role in managing the wine industry's sustainability program, Entwine Australia. Marty also serves as the biosecurity officer for Australian Vignerons and is a strong advocate for industry in this area. Now, I'd also like to thank and acknowledge Wine Australia for providing funding and support for AWRI webinars. For those of you that have just joined us, welcome. Today's topic is biosecurity, current and future risks. And I'll hand over now to our speaker, Dr. Marty Longbottom to start the conversation. Hello everyone, thanks for coming along to the webinar this morning. As Michael's just said, I'm going to talk a bit about biosecurity, but essentially what I wanted to say was that the, the impacts of pests and diseases can have devastating effects on grapevine growth, yield and fruit quality. And keeping our vineyards free from pests and diseases is paramount to the long-term sustainability of our vineyards. So this morning I thought what, I was, what I'd talk a little bit about is the recent biosecurity incidents that we've experienced here in Australia, and also provide some updated information on these incidents. And then after that, I'm going to discuss some of the future risks and how we can do better in ensuring Australia's vineyards are kept free from exotic pests specifically. So firstly, I just wanted to clarify a couple of terms that I'll be referring to throughout my presentation. The first one is the use of the word endemic in, in relation to endemic pests. Um, endemic pests, when I'm talking about those, some of the examples of these are things like powdery and downy mildews, botrytis, Utipa and other trunk diseases, but essentially the endemic pests are those that are known to be present in Australia in vineyards. And there's lots of information on the AWR um, website, including a number of fact sheets. So that's the endemic pests, they're the ones that are known to be present in Australia. But what I'm mostly gonna focus on today is the exotic pests. So the exotic ones are those that are not known to be present in Australia. They're known to exist in other countries and they're known to affect grapevine production and some examples of these include Pierce's disease, brown marmorated stink bug, red blotch associated virus, and black rot. They're just a few examples, not an extensive list, but I just wanted to point out the difference between endemic and exotic pests. So I wanted to start really by talking about grapevine Pinot Gris virus. As many of you will already be familiar, grapevine Pinot Gris virus was first reported to be in Australia in November 2016. So at that time, we hadn't had any previous reports of GPGV being present in Australia. And what happened was that it triggered a response under the Emergency Plant Pest Response Deed or the EPPRD. Now, what this um, deed is, it's essentially an insurance policy for the wine industry in case of an um, exotic pest incursion, it protects um, the industry against the cost of managing an exotic pest incursion. How this works is that Essentially, if, there's a, if there is a detection of an exotic pest, like in this example here, grapevine Pinot Gris virus, if it's somebody in industry who sees the, the virus or whatever that exotic pest is, there's a 1800 number there you can see on the screen that you can ring and report that, that um, detection of the pest. Now, in the case of Pinot Gris virus, um, a grower had submitted a sample to a diagnostic lab and in the lab, it was detected as Pinot Gris virus. And because it wasn't known to be present in Australia, there's actually mandatory reporting requirements for those laboratories to report it. So in the case of Pinot Gris virus, it was reported. And this activates a response under that deed that I spoke about before. Now, the picture you can see in the center of your screen there is, you can see the acronym CCEPP. Now that stands for the Consultative Committee for Emergency Plant Pests. Under the deed, if there is a detection of an emergency plant pest, this committee gets together to talk about how that um, pest is going to be managed. So the report was made and the people that sit around this table include all of the state biosecurity agencies, the Department of Agriculture Water Resources, so that's a federal, the Federal Department of Agriculture, Plant Health Australia, 
and the industry body who represents the industry and what, what the industry needs and wants. So in the case of the wine industry, that representative is Australian vignerons. Now, because of grapevine Pinot Gris virus, it, it affects all grapevines, not just wine grapes, it includes table grapes as well. There were other industry representatives um, invited to sit around this consultative committee group. So the table grape industry were there, also the dried fruit industry and the, the nursery growers. So the input in these discussions comes from all of these parties. Now, the discussions themselves, it, this, it starts where the main question being asked is, what we need to do is determine whether or not that incursion is actually an emergency plant pest or an EPP. And there's a number of questions we need to go through to see whether or not this pest actually qualifies for a claim under this insurance policy. So we're, we're asking, is it an exotic pest? Does it cause economic loss? And is it technically feasible to eradicate or TFE? Now, if we can answer yes to all of those questions, we form a national management group to, to deal with that incursion. And we also come up with a national management plan. And we do that as a um, collaborative exercise between industry, the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources, and also the state biosecurity agencies. What happens then once we've done that is that we can actually access funds to come up with a plan to control or eradicate the pest. And then in the case, if there was um, an example, for example, if this virus had turned out to be um, isolated in, a, in one particular vineyard, there'd also be cost, uh, sorry, money available to reimburse that grower for costs that it might have taken to, to pull out the vineyard. Now, on the other hand, if we can't say yes, and if we actually have to say no, then none of those things kick into action and industry manages the problem. We still do this um, in collaboration with the state biosecurity agencies, but there's no money available to help us do this. So in the case of Pinot Gris virus, what happened is that we actually ended up having a no. So I said before that the first report came in in November 2016 and those meetings around that table of the CCEPP lasted about 19 months. It might seem like an incredibly long time, but the thing that came out of those meetings was that we actually got some surveillance done in a couple of states. We got surveillance done in New South Wales and also in South Australia. And that was mainly because industry started talking with the rest of industry and we actually asked people to be on the lookout for this virus. And a lot of the surveillance that was done was growers sending in samples of um, symptoms that they thought looked like Pinot Gris virus. Now, uh, on top of that, in South Australia, Vine Health Australia coordinated a lot of surveillance, targeted surveillance, where they also got a lot of samples tested. And the um, outcome of that was that um, we were able to say for sure that Pinot Gris virus wasn't just isolated in one place, that there were a number of detections, and we now know that it is present in several states. Now, when we first um, started dealing with this incursion of grapevine Pinot Gris virus, there was a lot of unknown information. And you can see on the bottom of the screen there, there, there are now a couple of fact sheets around Pinot Gris virus. The AWRI fact sheet has been updated at least three times in the last 18 months. And that's in response to new information as it's been coming in, we've been able to update those um, fact sheets. But probably the best uh, outcome of this really is that we've now been funded by One Australia to do a new project to have a, a much more expansive look at the existing literature and existing science around this virus so that we can understand it and manage it better. So what we do know about grapevine Pinot Gris virus is, is that it's present in at least 28 wine and table grape varieties. Um, that's not here in Australia but overseas and it is present in quite a number of different countries and it's almost unfortunate that it was named grapevine Pinot Gris virus. It just happens that when it was first discovered, it was found in Pinot Gris. In Australia, it's not been known, it's not been known to occur in Pinot Gris. We also know that this virus has symptomatic and asymptomatic strains, which makes it really difficult in the case of a detection where you can have a detection without any symptoms at all. So it's pretty difficult in trying to understand the spread of this virus. What we do know though, is that it, it's transmitted by propagation and there's a good chance it's also uh, transmitted by vineyard mites. So if you do suspect that you have grapevine Pinot Gris virus, I'd always advise send samples in for analysis. If you get a positive result for Pinot Gris virus, the first thing you need to do is control the potential vectors of the virus and don't use any of these vines for propagation. 
if you're planting or grafting, request from your nursery that you do receive clean propagation material. And if you want to go back to more information about um, how to take samples and how to submit samples, there's another fact sheet on the AWRI website telling you how to do that. The key learnings from grapevine pinot gris virus is that basically it's, it's unlikely to be a major threat to Australian viticulture. But having said that, don't ignore it if you think you do have the symptoms. The incident of Pinot you know, Gris virus has been a pretty timely test of our biosecurity arrangements. We've learned a lot through this process and I think taking on um, that experience, we can do it better next time around. But I think the best thing is that it has raised a lot more industry awareness and engagement around biosecurity. So moving on from Pinot you know, Gris virus, um, the brown marmorated stink bugs. Now, these stink bugs have been getting a lot more attention uh, recently as well, and I'm hoping that everyone listening knows a bit about these stink bugs. The brown marmorated stink bug is well established in North America and Asia, but currently it's not present in Australia. You can see the picture there. We do have native stink bugs that look fairly similar to these um, brown marmorated stink bugs. They're not the same. Um, and these um, exotic stink bugs are incredibly invasive. Uh, they have a wide host range, that is they live on lots of different plant hosts um, and they are a serious nuisance pest. If you have any doubts about how serious this pest is, there's a great article that was published by The New Yorker. If you Google that one and have a read, it's really pretty scary. So the problem for us as an industry and more broadly in horticulture in Australia is that the brown marmorated stink bugs feed on fresh fruit. And you can see here this picture on the left is the brown marmorated stink bugs on an apple. Um, and you can see the scars left by these bugs feeding on the flesh of the fruit. They um, put their stylus into the skin and they create scars, but then also under the skin, if you cut the skin off, you'd see there's a lot of damaged tissue underneath. Now on the right there, you can see similar damage done to grapes. Um, we know that we can withstand a little bit of damage to grapevine skins. Um, and the kind of damage that you can see in this picture would be really a result of pretty plagued proportions of these bugs. There'd be a lot of bugs to cause that much damage. What we would hope is that if we did get these stink bugs in a vineyard with monitoring, we could detect it early. And we do have agrochemicals that control these stink bugs. There may be issues with MRLs, so you may not be able to harvest the fruit after using these insecticides, but we could control them and you'd hope that it wouldn't get this bad. The other problem though, as with any um, damage to the skins of grapes, is that you open them up for invasion by secondary um, pathogens. So it, is, it will be a problem if these um, bugs do get to Australia. They're certainly causing problems in vineyards in North America. Perhaps though, the biggest problem with um, brown marmorated stink bugs is that, as their name suggests, they smell, they smell bad. And we know from the experience of our um, colleagues in America that if these stink bugs get into ferments, they will impart those stinky characters into the wine. So the smell, one of them that they talk about is it's a coriander-like smell, which is something that we don't really want in our ferments. And there's quite a bit of um, research winemaking going on overseas to have a look at exactly what the tolerance is or what the um, thresholds are for tolerance of these um, particular aromas. And you can see here that they're um, doing small ferments, they're putting the stink bugs in there fermenting it through, making the wine, and then they're doing sensory trials on this. So I guess, fortunately for us in Australia, we, we don't have these, but you know, the work is being done overseas and we're being able to access that research. But what we do understand is that they will be a major problem if they get into our wineries. So the brown marmorated stink bugs, they've been known to um, be present in containers arriving in Australia for at least the last couple of years. But those arrivals of the stink bugs have been increasing in frequency in the last couple of years. Um, last year, <coughs> excuse me, last year the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources um, imposed uh, extraordinary measures to try and prevent the impacts of um, these bugs arriving in Australia. And there, this is after two times when the stink bugs were actually detected beyond the border. So what happens is that if these um, stink bugs are through random inspections detected in containers on ships coming into Australia, um, hopefully they would fumigate and kill those bugs. Um, in this case, they were either not detected or fumigated and didn't work. It, it's really, we don't know exactly what happened, but the containers that arrived in Australia arrived uh, beyond the ports at warehouses that the containers were opened up and live and dead stink bugs were found inside of them. 
So it was um, fortunate that the people dealing with those containers actually detected or saw them, recognised them and reported them so that the um, relevant state biosecurity agencies could deal with them. And they did surveillance over a number of weeks to make sure that the stink bugs didn't go any further than where they were first seen. So this went on for quite a number of weeks and um, we're now very confident that those incursions were contained without spread uh, beyond where those containers were. So this year, because of those increasing numbers of detections of the stink bugs, the Department of Agricultural and Water Resources have again imposed mandatory treatment of high risk imported goods to reduce the risk of brown marmorated stink bugs arriving in Australia. So um, you can see there's a link there to the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources website where you can get more information about what these measures are. But essentially starting on the 1st of September, anything that's considered high risk will be treated to make sure that those stink bugs, if they are in the containers, are killed and that they don't arrive in Australia alive. So if you've got any questions about that, I mean, you please go to the Department of Agricultural Water Resources website to get the details. But if you've got other concerns related to, you know, vineyards and wineries, please contact the AWR help desk. Just as importantly, if you are uh, receiving any imported goods, especially if you're receiving the container itself and you open it up and you see any stink bugs or anything, any other insects, for that matter, it doesn't really matter what they are. And if you're at all concerned that these are exotic bugs, make sure that you get enough information that we can do a proper report on it. So I'd say firstly, take a photograph of anything you see in there. If you do see any insects, collect and contain a specimen. So put it in a plastic bag or some kind of container. If you've opened any boxes in a, out of a container, you know, seal them up again, repack the container if it's possible and shut the doors so that if there's anything alive, it can't get outside. And then the container itself, don't move it from where it is, especially don't move it outside where bugs can escape. So if, you've, if um, anyone has seen anything like this, make sure that you, know, you do report it. The next step is to ring that exotic plant pest hotline, the number's there, 1800 084 881, and report it. But the more information you've got, the better um, chance there is that this can be um, contained. So moving on from that, I just wanted to talk about Pierce's disease. So Pierce's disease, or Xylella as it's commonly known, is the number one plant pest of Australian agriculture. Xylella is known to be present um, mostly in North America and there's certainly vineyards that have been quite devastated by Pierce's disease. But I guess what, what makes it a high risk for us is that not only does Xylella or Pierce's disease, which is a bacteria live in grapevines, it also has a whole number of other hosts, including citrus and olives and lots of other horticultural crops, but also ornamental plants. So because of that host range, the likelihood of it surviving and spreading is, makes it much higher risk. So Pierce's disease, like I said before, it's a bacteria that lives in the xylem of grapevines and it pretty much just clogs up the xylem vessels, which means that the water can't move throughout the vine. And when you see vines affected by Xylella, a lot of the time it can be just confused with the vines being under water stress. You can see here in these pictures on the far left, what makes it um, quite easy to identify if you have seen it is that, especially in grape, uh, sorry, red varieties, you can see the arrow pointing there to what we call a leaf scorch the redness there and then outside of that redness you can see a yellow halo so that's um, pretty consistent with a xylella infection and then in some varieties especially we can see uh, in the left hand picture and also the middle picture bunches also tend to collapse towards the end of the season in the middle picture the other thing you can see there is that on the cane there towards the end of the season you can see that band of necrotic tissue and it's got a green island in the middle of it. So that's fairly common with Pierce's disease as well. You can also see those um, berries there have started to collapse. And on the far right, you can see what we call a matchstick petiole. So if you follow the petiole from the, the cane outwards, the leaf falls off the petiole, which is also quite uncommon for that to happen. The usual obsession point is at the cane. So the leaf falls off and you can see it's like a burnt match. The necrotic tissue extends from the end down and yeah, it looks like a burnt match. And I'm not aware of anything else that causes this match stick looking petiole. So they're just three symptoms of xylella that you should be looking out for. I hope we don't find this in Australia, but it's just something that everyone should familiarise themselves with the symptoms of it. 
And again, if you do see it, there's that 1800 number again. That's what you need to call if you do suspect you have Xylella or any other exotic pest. A couple of other high priority exotic pests include black rot and also grapevine red blotch associated virus. Um, the, you can see that the symptoms of those two are quite distinctive as well. You may confuse black rot with a bit of spray drift perhaps, but if you saw something like that and you knew that there, had, there was no risk of spray drift, you might think that you know, black rot could be your problem. Also the red blotch, there's nothing else that really looks like that one. So if you saw anything that looked like that, again, please report it to the exotic plant pest hotline. Now for more information about those high priority exotic pests of viticulture, there's two links there that take you to Plant Health Australia and also Farm Biosecurity. And on those websites, you'll find the Industry Biosecurity Plan and um, Biosecurity Manual for Viticulture. And they've got lots of good examples of um, photographs of the exotic pests and also how to manage them. <coughs> Excuse me. A quick word on viruses. Um, earlier this year, the AWI released an e-bulletin around grapevine virus testing, and there's a link there that if you go and have a look at that, you can see the e-bulletin itself. Um, we are getting more and more reports of viruses, and a couple of years ago, we saw a lot more virus symptoms in Australian vineyards. So we wanted to put it out there that we need to be a bit more conscious of viruses and probably do um, some more surveillance on what viruses and to work out what viruses we have and what impact they're having on Australian vineyards. Obviously, we want to maximise the long term health of vineyards by using pest free propagation material. And we are in a bit of a planting phase in the Australian wine industry. There are a lot of people um, pulling out vineyards, replanting and also grafting. So the recommendation is that all material should be purchased from accredited nurseries. So that's wine industry nursery accreditation scheme. So not just sign material, but also the rootstocks if you're doing grafting, making sure you know the virus status of the rootstock. All vineyards should be routinely inspected for virus symptoms. And if you see any symptoms that those vines should get tested to confirm the virus status. If you do get positive results, the viruses themselves should be removed from the vineyard so that they're not there as a source of infection and the risk of it spreading to the rest of the vines. And if you do have virus vectors, so common ones include scale and mealybug, control those so that you're not spreading it and making the problem worse. Again, there's a fact sheet on that on the AWRI website. And for those of you familiar with the Entwine Australia program, so that's the National Sustainability Program for the Australian wine industry, what we've been doing for the last three years is that we've had a survey for all of our members to complete around lots of different areas of practices in the vineyard. And one of those is around biosecurity. Now, uh, last year we had more than 200 people complete the survey. And I just wanted to compare a couple of different uh, areas that we asked questions about. One of them is around chemical management and the other is around biosecurity management. Now, in chemical management, on average, across a whole number of different questions that we asked, 96% of the members were at best practice. So that's around how we manage chemicals, how we do our record keeping, how we store chemicals, handle them, the safety of chemical use and disposal of chemicals. So we're operating at a really, really high level in terms of our chemical management. Now with biosecurity, um, coincidentally, 96% of the people who uh, filled out the survey said that they do source the, all of their propagation material from accredited nurseries, which is excellent. But there was a big weakness in the survey results around on-farm biosecurity systems. So specifically um, around restricting, inspecting and controlling visitor and vehicle access. So the reason I thought I'd share this with you today is to just let you know that I think there's probably a whole lot more we can be doing around biosecurity. And I think it's time that we revisited this and make sure that we raise awareness around biosecurity specific to these things here um, so that we can be doing it a lot better. And if you want more information about Entwine or any of those results, uh, go and have a look at that web link that's there on the screen. So just lastly, I wanted to um, just quickly point out that I guess the key things around um, managing biosecurity, and these are listed in the back of the dog book, which is published by the AWI each year. Be aware of the biosecurity threats that are out there. So I mentioned before those couple of web links that list off and, and have photographs of all of our um, priority exotic pests. Make sure you use pest free propagation material. So that is starting firstly by just purchasing any propagation from accredited suppliers. Keep it clean. Make sure you're practicing um, standard vineyard hygiene practices. 
check your vineyard, monitor it regularly and be on the lookout, not just for the ordinary endemic pests, but look for the uh, symptoms that you don't usually see. Make sure you abide by the law. And this is around things specifically around transporting um, vine material across state borders. And if you see anything unusual, please report it using that 1800 number. This is um, just a photograph of that biosecurity manual that I mentioned before and those two web links again. There's a lot of useful information here that you should go and have a look at. And then there's a whole um, lot of other web links that you could go and get more information about biosecurity resources. So I wanted to finish it there. Thanks very much for um, listening. But I just want to acknowledge also Australian Vignerons for funding um, this role that part of my job entails. Um, and if you've got any questions, um, I'm happy to take them now. Okay, thank you, Marty, and thank you for <clears throat> providing such a comprehensive um, update on a, on a really important topic. Um, as Marty's indicated, we will roll straight into a and a from here, and Marty's going to stick around for a little while. So if you've got any questions that you want to uh, pose, please start sending them through now. Uh, for anyone that's new to webinars, um, I'll just remind you quickly how you can ask a question. Open the Q&A button or box on your webinar menu. Um, type your question and send it through. It's that easy. Um, so please start sending through your questions now. Um, while we're waiting to see what questions we do receive, um, I'll just remind our audience that we do have a AWRI webinar next week. And that's on Thursday, 13th of September. Um, DPI New South Wales, Darren Fahey will be providing results from a re recent anti-transparent trial, um, which might, may provide some solutions to help combat the rising issue of compressed vintages via manipulation of ripening. Now, if you'd like to register for this session, please visit the AWR, AWRI website. So still waiting for some questions to come through, Marty. Um, quick question from me while we, while we do wait. Um, in the event that someone does suspect they have a reportable incident and does ring that hotline, what can they expect to happen from there? Yeah. <clears throat> what would happen is if you do ring this 1800 number, and I've done this myself to, to work out what exactly does happen. Um, first of all, you'd be prompted to um, record which state that you're in. So you get a list of numbers saying, you know, for example, if you're in South Australia, click one. If you're in New South Wales, press two. And it will put you through directly to your relevant state biosecurity agency. The person that you talk to won't necessarily be an expert in the particular pest that you're concerned about, but they will have a good general biosecurity knowledge. Um, so give them as much detail as you can about what you've seen. Quite often what they do then is ask you to send in any photographs or the extra information that you've got. And then depending on what, what it looks like, the next step could be, and again, it really depends on the risk of the pest, they may actually send somebody out to have a look at the vineyard and have a look at the symptoms themselves. So that, that's in general what would happen. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Uh, another one from me, Marty. Um, Outside of the US, has the brown mummerated stink bug been located anywhere else? And if so, you know, what have the impacts been? Yeah, definitely. It's um, through Europe and also Asia. Um, in terms of uh, the impact on agriculture and horticulture, the, probably the most reports that we've seen have come out of North America. Um, and you, you saw those pictures that I showed of the scarring and that on fresh produce. I think the impact on them has been much greater than it has on the, on the wine industry. I mean, it has had an impact on table grapes and also juicing grapes in North America, but the impact by, has been much greater on uh, fresh produce. Obviously, no one you know, particularly loves buying apples or other fruit that's got blemishes on it. That's the biggest problem. It doesn't necessarily affect the taste or flavour of these fruits, but it does make them unsaleable. So they've got a very low tolerance for the sink bugs. Okay. Thanks, Marty. Uh, it doesn't look like we're going to get any questions from our audience. Did you have anything final you wanted to um, 
to say before we start to wrap up? Not really, just to, just that if you do want to ask any questions, um, I understand it can be uh, challenging doing it via this media, but my email address is there. Feel free to contact me directly or otherwise direct your questions to the help desk at AWRI. Yeah, great. And I'll, I'll include Marty's and the help desk contact details in the uh, follow-up email that goes out after the session as well. Okay, so we'll leave it there. Um, I'd like to first extend a thank you to Marty for providing the content for this um, very informative session. And I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for uh, participating in today's session. Uh, attendees will re receive a follow-up email with a link to this recording. Um, I spoke earlier about next week's webinar. You can see the details there on your screen now. Um, if you'd like to register, please visit the AWRI website. Thank you again for attending and participating in today's session and I look forward to seeing you at the next AWRI webinar.